On the morning of February 16th, 2003, the Diamond Squad, the world's only specialised diamond police, arrived at what was undoubtedly one of the most secure vaults on Earth. They made a call to SecuriLink, the vault's alarm company, and asked for the status of the alarm. Fully functional was the reply. The vault is secure. But they could see with their own eyes that this wasn't the case. The foot-thick, three-ton steel door was wide open and undamaged. They stepped inside the subterranean vault and found themselves knee-deep in cash boxes, bags and jewellery cases. The floor was a sea of treasures of unfathomable value. Diamonds, rubies and emeralds of every conceivable cotton clarity littered the tiled floor. There were priceless artefacts and heirlooms, thick wads of cash, Rolex watches and solid gold bricks. If this was the leftover loot the thieves were unable to carry, it was clear that this was a heist of impressive scale. In fact, an estimated $100 million worth of jewels had been taken, in what turned out to be the largest diamond heist in history. And all done with stealth and intelligence. No alarms were triggered and no one was hurt. It was a clandestine robbery in the dead of night. Hello and welcome to The Little Shop of Crime. I've covered a lot of tragic cases lately, so I fancied stocking something a little different today. And hey, theft is still crime, and this is theft on the grandest scale. Honestly, it's like a plot lifted straight from a Mission Impossible film. But first, some quick shopkeeping. I offer interesting, usually lesser known true crime cases most weeks. So if you fancy stopping by again in future, feel free to subscribe. Okay, let's investigate. This is the $100 million diamond heist. Today we are popping over to Belgium and to its largest city, Antwerp. Just a short 40 km or 25 mile trip north of its capital Brussels, the nigh on 2000 year old city is dripping with history and culture and home to over half a million people. For centuries Antwerp has been a leader in world trade, famous for its colossal port, which even today is one of the largest on earth. And the historic Bourse of Antwerp was the world's first purpose-built commodity exchange. But today Antwerp is recognised as the world's hub of a more specific trade. Diamonds. In the centre of this bustling city, right by the historic railway station, sits its illustrious diamond district, occupying an area roughly one square mile. It's an impressive network of jewellers, cutters, polishers and dealers. 84% of the world's rough diamonds pass through the districts every year, with over $16 billion in cut gems traded within its exchanges. And that's despite the fact that an estimated three quarters of trades are made under the table. The Diamond District is undoubtedly one of the densest concentrations of wealth on the planet, so it's no surprise that it has two police stations and is under 24 hour dedicated surveillance with an estimated 2,000 security cameras watching the inside and outside of its buildings at all times. And then there's the Antwerp World Diamond Centre itself. It's an imposing grey fortress located on the Hoveney airstrap, a narrow street that cuts right through the middle of the Diamond District. The street is blocked by heavy steel bollards and the building has its own private security force. And that's just the surface level of security that protects the sensor's famous vault. Owners of priceless trinkets, diamonds and jewels opted to store their valuables inside the vault because it was far more secure than any bank. Situated two stories below ground, the bomb-proof vault was supposedly impregnable, protected by ten layers of high-tech security. There was a camera, of course, monitoring the three-ton steel vault door at all times. The door itself had a combination lock with 100 million possible permutations. There was a keyed lock that required a theoretically impossible to duplicate foot long key. A foot long key, imagine that, like a full subway sandwich sized key. There was a seismic sensor that would detect even the slightest rumblings of a drill. 
Not that there'd be any point in trying that. The foot-thick door was built to withstand 12 hours of constant heavy-duty drilling. There was a magnetic sensor that provided a constant magnetic field, which would be broken if the door were opened, triggering the alarm systems. And behind the door was a locked steel grate. Even if you managed to bypass all of that, the inside of the vault itself had a light sensor, a security camera, a heat and motion sensor, and a keypad required for disarming them. This was the Titanic of vaults, and it turned out to be about as impenetrable as the Titanic was unsinkable. Q. Leo Nota Bartolo a blue-eyed charmer, a master manipulator with speech level 100. Born in 1952, Leo lived in Turin, Italy, in the foothills of the Alps. By his own account, he was a born thief, starting from the age of just six when he stole 5,000 lira, or about eight dollars, from a sleeping milkman. It wasn't exactly Ocean's Eleven, but it sparked something deep inside him, a lasting devotion to the art of thievery. In his teenage years, he stole from teachers, learned how to pick pockets and locks and hotwire cars. In his twenties, he began to focus his attention on people, mostly jewellery dealers, tracking their movements and habits. Then came his thirties, when he used his razor-sharp charm to begin to assemble a potent team of thieves, each with his own special ability. It was a bit like the Avengers, but for crooks. There were key forgers, alarm specialists, safe crackers and lock pickers. By the turn of the millennium, he'd managed to pull off dozens of large-scale robberies as the figurehead of the team of thieves that officials would go on to dub the School of Turin. And Leo was very acquainted with Antwerp's diamond district. It offered the perfect places to fence stolen jewellery, where its gold could be melted down and jewels removed and sold. He visited every couple of weeks and even had a small rented apartment close to the Diamond District itself. During his visits, he'd regularly sit inside a small cafe on Hovenierstrat, where he could sip espressos and gaze out at the heart of the world's diamond trade, where he'd watch wealthy merchants skitter from place to place, concealing bags of gems or with small briefcases handcuffed to their wrists. It was while sitting there that he began to hatch a plan to integrate himself into this world. In the year 2000, he began renting a small, barely furnished office inside the World Diamond Centre itself, costing him 687 Belgian francs per month. This provided him with an ID card that granted him 24-hour access to the building, where he posed as an Italian gem merchant. The card also gave him access to a safety deposit box within the vault, where he stored modest gems and set up trades with genuine dealers. He spent more than two years using his charm to befriend staff and to learn the layout and security systems of the building and its vault, gradually worming his way deep inside the diamond trade community, whose members were unaware that they'd welcomed a prolific jewel thief into their midst. It was all part of a bigger plan. He was playing the long game, but he couldn't do it alone. Infiltrating the world diamond sensor's vault would take an audacious heist of a magnitude unlike anything the world had ever seen, particularly if he wanted to do it properly and covertly, which would minimise his chances of being caught and maximise the potential payout. And for this, he'd need some help. Leo began to assemble a crew of the most talented thieves he knew. A motley band of men with the intention of taking from the rich and, well, keeping it. First, there was Speedy, a skilled thief but a skittish, paranoid man. The others thought he was a liability, but he was Leo's oldest friend. They'd worked together for 30 years. The monster, named not just for his imposing size and physical strength, he also had a monstrous set of abilities. He was an incredible lockpicker, electrician and mechanic, and he was an experienced getaway driver. The others were a little afraid of him. The genius. He was a master electrician, specialising in alarms. An all-round electronics expert, he was said to be capable of disabling virtually any alarm system. And finally, the King of Keys, a much older man who had used his time to establish himself as one of the best key forgers on Earth. He was quiet, composed, and of course, a gifted lockpicker too. And so the crew was assembled, and the planning of what would come to be known as the Heist of the Century was underway. And it seems that Leo may have shared the same gadget supplier as James Bond. Don't touch that! 
It's my lunch. He'd managed to get hold of a pen with a tiny camera inside it. Remember, this was the early 2000s and smartphones weren't really a thing yet, but his pen cam was capable of taking and storing up to 100 high resolution images. With it poking out of his breast pocket, he would take trips around the diamond sensor and down to the vault itself. Security were by now familiar with him, so his regular presence raised no suspicion. Photography was forbidden in the Diamond District, but he was conducting detailed surveillance, covertly snapping every inch of the vault and its surroundings. Using the wealth of pictures he obtained, an accomplice allegedly built a full-scale and exact replica of the vault inside a warehouse. According to Leo, stepping inside for the first time felt like he'd walked straight into a movie. Everything was identical. The door, the security systems, even the 189 locked boxes that stored the treasures. The team spent 18 months using the replica to practice every move of the heist. Cue the obligatory training montage. That's quite enough of that. But the heist would require some more preparation, and more bold moves from Leo during his numerous visits down into the vault. In September of 2002, he was standing in the vault's antechamber, the claustrophobic room that led to its huge door. He hoped that security guards who were by now acquainted with his face were a little lax and weren't paying full attention to their monitors. In full view of a camera, he raised his arms above his head. But this wasn't any old stretch or yawn. He was deftly sticking a miniature camera to the ceiling. He positioned it so that an overhead light obscured it from the security camera's view and so that it was almost invisible to the human eye when the light was on. His camera watched the door around the clock, spying the guards in putting the vault's code and the video footage was broadcast to a nearby sensor. The genius hid this sensor inside what appeared to be an ordinary fire extinguisher, which Leo attached to a wall inside a storage room, close enough to the vault for it to receive the video feed. Amazingly, the fire extinguisher was fully functional, but inside was a waterproof chamber that housed the electronics. The video footage also showed guards inserting the footlong key. Using this footage alone, the King of Keys managed to duplicate it. That shows the level of talent he had. He didn't even need the original to form a replica of this apparently irreproducible key. It was time for Leo to make one last routine visit to the vault. Once inside, in one swift, singular motion, he pulled a can of women's hairspray from his breast pocket and sprayed the motion sensor with its sticky vapour, a manoeuvre he'd practiced countless times before. The oil in the hairspray was transparent, but it provided a layer of insulation that would temporarily restrict its thermal sensing capabilities. He knew the sensor would only trigger if it detected both heat and motion. One degree of difference in the room created by an occupant's warm breath or body heat would trigger the alarm. The residue would last until the heist at least, but it was difficult to estimate how long it would give them once there. When testing, they estimated one man would have roughly five minutes inside the vault, before his body heat penetrated the oily film and triggered the alarm. But the atmospheric conditions of the vault itself would differ from the replica, so there was a good chance he wouldn't even have that long to disable the system. Shortly before midnight, Leo's rented Peugeot 307 pulled up on Pelicanstrat, a street on the eastern rim of the Diamond District. Speedy, the monster, the genius, and the king of keys hopped out, dressed all in black, wearing rubber gloves and carrying large duffel bags. Leo remained in the car, listening carefully to his police scanner. The king of keys picked the lock of a derelict office building and they slipped inside. They'd done their research and knew the building shared a rear garden with the diamond sensor and was one of the few parts of the district that wasn't monitored with cameras at the time. The genius had left a ladder there one previous night, which he used to climb to a small balcony on the sensor's second floor. The balcony was watched by a thermal sensor, but he knew this already, so from his bag he pulled out a huge homemade polyester shield. The shield's low thermal conductivity prevented his heat signature from reaching the sensor, making him effectively invisible. Slowly he approached the sensor before placing the shield directly in front of it, rendering it useless. 
The others scrambled up the ladder and watched as the genius then began to effortlessly disable an alarm connected to one of the balcony's windows. And then one by one they scrambled through the open window. And as easily as that, the fearless four found themselves inside the World Diamond Center, where they made their way down a stairwell and into the pitch black antechamber of the vault. They covered the security camera with a black plastic bag and flicked on the light to expose the familiar vault door they'd tackled in the warehouse over the previous 18 months. And it was time for the genius to demonstrate another of his inventions, when he pulled a homemade aluminium block from his bag. Using double-sided gaffer tape, he stuck the device onto the side of the two plates that formed the magnetic field on the door's opening edge, and he carefully unscrewed their bolts. The magnets were now free, but his custom device held them together, allowing the magnetic field to remain constant whilst he pulled it away from the door and taped it to the wall of the antechamber. Next, it was the turn of the King of Keys to make use of his footlong replica key, but he had a niggling hunch. In the videos he'd watched in order to form the duplicate, the guard would usually visit a utility room right before he opened the vault. He searched the room and was astounded at what he found. All this high-tech security, all these sensors and systems, and there was the original key just hanging there inside an unlocked utility room right near the vault. Well, there wasn't any point in letting the vault's manufacturer know that their key was actually replicable, so naturally he grabbed the original. He slotted the huge key into the keyhole, and the genius wound the combination lock to the numbers they'd learnt from the hidden camera footage. He then nodded towards the monster, who flicked the antechamber light back off again. They'd have to open the door in total darkness, so as not to trigger the light sensor inside the vault. The king of keys turned the key inside the lock until he heard the dull click inside. It was unlocked. He grasped the prongs on the wheel at the centre of the heavy door and rotated it, and the eight thick steel cylinder bolts retreated inside the door, and it swung open. Excited, Speedy ran back up the stairwell where he could get phone reception, and he called Leo, who was still waiting anxiously back at the car. We're in. The police scanner was silent. No alarms had been triggered, and only the five men knew the vault had been breached. In total blackness, the King of Keys easily picked the lock of the steel grate that desperately formed the last barrier into the vault. He stepped away. It was the monster's time to shine. He used a tub of paint he'd found in the utility room to prop the grate open, and he stepped inside. It was his job to disable the remaining alarm systems. His body heat was already beginning to fill the vault, and the film of hairspray would only last so long before the sensor picked up on the temperature change. He'd have to act fast but keep his heart rate as low as possible. As he'd practiced many times in the replica, he took precisely 11 strides into the vault, and reached up to the panelled ceiling, pushing one of them out of the way. He felt around inside the opening and found the two wires that connected the security system to the alarms. If any of the sensors inside the vault were triggered, the alarm would sound, and it would all be over. Working in total darkness and just by the touch of his gloved hands, he used wire strippers to tear away the plastic coating on the cables. One wrong move, one cut too deep and the wire would sever, breaking the circuit and triggering the alarm. As soon as the copper wires were exposed, the monster clipped a small device to them, creating a bridge that completed the circuit but bypassed all of the sensors inside the vault. Thanks to him, these sensors were now rendered blind. It was finally safe for the others to join him, but they took no chances. The men placed another black bag over the camera, plastered the light sensor with gaffer tape, and placed a pre-made styrofoam box over the heat and motion sensor. But even then they decided to work in total darkness. They were all familiar with the layout of the vault by now anyway. Each of the locked boxes was protected by a key and combination lock, but the men knew that the seismic sensor inside the vault door was still active, so using power tools to force them open wasn't an option. But they'd already accounted for this. The King of Keys pulled a small hand-cranked drill from his bag, and one by one, using the briefest flashes of torchlight to align it, he forced its tip into the lock of each box, and wound the drill until the latch snapped and the box popped open. They filled the duffel bags with jewels and cash, gold and watches, and leather pouches brimming with diamonds. By 5.30am they'd managed to open 123 of the 189 metal boxes and empty them of their spoils. But it wouldn't be long before the sun came up, and the Diamond District would be a buzz of people once again. Speedy ran back to the top of the stairwell and told Leo to get ready. They were on their way. 
It took almost a full hour for the men to haul all of the heavy bags back up the stairwell, out of the window and down the ladder, but eventually all four of them made it back to the abandoned office building where Leo's car was idling. They calmly loaded their bags inside and set off on foot towards Leo's apartment while he inconspicuously pulled away. And that was it. The team of thieves had pulled off the perfect heist. No one would even know the vault had been compromised until someone paid it a visit on Monday morning, by which time they'd all be back in Italy. Leo and his old friend Speedy left Antwerp later that afternoon, heading south on the E19, a motorway that connects Antwerp with Brussels. They were tired but excited. Neither man had slept in two days, but the heist had gone without a hitch. The other guys were already on their way back to Italy with the haul, leaving Leo and Speedy with the simple task of burning all the evidence. The marked banknotes, invoices and deeds that had been inside the locked boxes, as well as anything else that might connect them to the robbery. Leo wanted to burn it in a warehouse in France, but Speedy was very nervous and wanted rid of it as quickly as possible. After some heavy persuasion, Leo eventually pulled off the motorway and onto a narrow dirt road that led to some dense woodland out of view of the passing cars back on the E19. Leo jumped out to look for a spot where they could burn all of it, and found the perfect place close to a footpath lined with tall trees. But when he got back to the car to collect it, Speedy was in the middle of a full-blown nervous breakdown. In a blind panic, he'd completely emptied the bag of evidence all around the woodland. The mud around the car glittered with tiny diamonds, and the wind had taken hold of banknotes and paper receipts which it scattered in bushes and undergrowth all around them. Leo was livid. It was he who had convinced the others to include Speedy in the plans after all. But now it would take too long to clear everything up. They stomped the visible specks of diamonds beneath the mud as best they could and got back in the car. No one would find that stuff out there anyway. The following morning, a local hunter, August Van Camp, who owned the land, stumbled upon the mess. He couldn't believe it. Teenagers had been on his land again and left all this litter behind. He called the local police to report the trespass. They'd heard it all before. He'd had previous disputes about youngsters on his property. They idly noted down his grumblings, until he mentioned some envelopes they'd left. Envelopes that had the Antwerp Diamond Centre address on them. A swarm of police arrived in minutes, and began to gather up the evidence. Before long, the extensive pile of rubbish was on a table back at the Diamond Squad headquarters. They found all sorts in there, most of it circumstantial. But it turned out that during the prep, one of the men had become a little bit... peckish and he'd decided to purchase a nice salami sandwich. The half-eaten sandwich was amongst the pile, but so was the receipt. The Diamond Squad paid a visit to the shop that it was purchased from. They matched the timestamp on the receipt with the store's CCTV footage, and there was a tall, muscular Italian man buying the sandwich. Using DNA left on it, they were able to identify him as Ferdinando Finotto, Police believe him to be the man also known as the Monster. But this wasn't all they found. There was an invoice for a low-light video system paid for by Leonardo Notabatolo himself. There was also a business card with the name and address of one Elio Dionorio, an Italian electronics expert already known to police. He is the man they believe goes by the name The Genius. Police also managed to find SIM cards linked to the men and they used cell tower evidence from pings that happened during the robbery to connect Leo's phone with a man by the name of Pietro Tavano, a nervous man and long-term friend of Leo, who is firmly believed to be speedy. By this time, Leo was back home with his family in Turin, unaware of the progress authorities had been making, but he'd have to go back to Antwerp. Firstly, his rental car was due back there that week, and secondly, he was concerned that he'd been at the Diamond Centre so often that if he suddenly disappeared, he'd be earmarked as a potential suspect. So the following morning, he and his wife jumped into his rented Peugeot and set off north and through the Swiss Alps towards Belgium. But they weren't even halfway there when police surrounded his home back in Italy. His son refused to let them in, but they had enough evidence to grant them a warrant, and so they forced their way inside. Within his safe, they found 17 polished diamonds, with certificates that connected them back to the vault. They had their man, but he was nowhere to be seen. 
and a man with his capabilities and connections could be anywhere by now. Little did they know he was racing right back to the scene of the crime. Leo cheerily waved at the Diamond Centre security guard whom he told he was stopping by to collect some mail. The guard acted casually, but he was aware that this was the man they were looking for, and so he contacted the detectives the moment Leo was inside. Police surrounded him in minutes. They bundled him into a police car and forced him to direct them to his apartment. When they arrived, Leo's wife was stepping out of the building, with a rug rolled up beneath her arm. A minute later and they'd have missed her. The rug was later vacuumed and specks of diamonds were found. She too was taken into custody. Leonardo Notar Bartolo was found guilty of orchestrating the heist. The Belgian court came down hard on him, and he was handed a 10 year sentence by the Court of Appeal of Antwerp in 2005. It might sound light given the magnitude of the theft, but since it wasn't an armed robbery and nobody was hurt, the sentence size was limited. He was eventually released on parole in 2009 after serving six of those years, but one of the conditions of the parole was that he was required to compensate the financial victims of the heist, which he made no attempt to do. So in 2011, a European arrest warrant was issued, and he was eventually caught again that year, at Charles de Gaulle Airport in Paris, during a layover from the United States to Turin. As a result, he was made to serve the remainder of his sentence, until he was released in 2017. But what about the others? Well, as a result of the sandwich evidence, Belgian police persuaded French authorities to raid the home of Ferdinando Finotto's girlfriend, who lived on the French Riviera, and where they found marked $100 bills that connected them to the Diamond Centre. Eventually, Finotto was arrested in Italy in November of 2007, where he was handed a five-year sentence for his role in the heist. Dionorio denied all involvement in the crime, but he did admit that he'd installed security cameras in Leo's Diamond Centre office but saliva found on some of the gaffer tape in the vault provided DNA that matched with him, and he was eventually extradited to Belgium in November 2007, where he too was given a five-year sentence. The cell tower evidence was enough to charge Pietro Tavano for his part, and he was also given five years. But what of the King of Keys? Well, Leo and his men refused to implicate one another. Police knew of a fifth man due to cell tower records and DNA evidence, but the King of Keys is the only man who has to date never been apprehended for his part in the heist. His identity is as yet unknown. During the initial six years of Leo's incarceration, he denied any involvement in the heist and refused to speak with any journalists. That is until he spoke to Wired in a tell-all story. In the interview, he claimed that a wealthy diamond dealer paid him to do it all. He also claimed that he didn't actually get his hands on the estimated $100 million worth of loot that was recorded as missing. According to him, the majority of the leather diamond pouches were empty, and he and his men ended up with around $20 million worth of goods. He alleged that he'd been the pawn in an enormous insurance scam, and that the diamond dealer had removed all his gems from the vault prior to the heist. That way he could claim them back on insurance and keep his diamonds. But officials have serious doubts about this. The heist itself exposed flaws in the vault's security, meaning there'd be very little in the way of insurance money anyway. But who knows? Either he was used as part of a scam, or the thieves did actually steal 100 million big ones. And it's a yarn he spun in order to cloud the true existence of his wealth, which was stashed out there somewhere. Like I said, three quarters of diamond deals were made off record anyway, so most of it's totally untraceable. And that's the story of the greatest diamond heist in history. Thanks so much for joining me, I really do appreciate your time. I know it wasn't a typical true crime case, but hopefully you gained something from this little change in pace. If so, please take a second to help out old Steve and give the video a quick like. And hopefully I'll see you again next time. Bye.